Hello, and welcome back to our discussion of genetically modified organisms and scientific ethics. Uh, what we're going to be looking at in this half of the lecture is uh, a couple examples and concerns associated with working with and using genetically modified organisms. So if we take a look at kind of one major use of genetically modified organisms, we're going to see it's used in agriculture. Uh, so if we take a look at this, um, on the top, uh, we've got a nice corn cob, uh, corn cob here, lots of kernels which are going to be present. Uh, and then on the bottom, we've got uh, a corn cob here uh, in which we've got uh, some type of infestation occurring where we've had insects probably go in and start to eat away uh, at the corn uh, being uh, produced as it's growing. Uh, and so what we can see is that insects consume anywhere from about 5 to 20 percent of the major grain crop. Uh, that are produced uh, around the world. Uh, and so if we take a look at this, this is, this is basically saying that uh, between a 20th and, and maybe a fifth uh, of all the crops uh, that are planted aren't going to make it to market, aren't going to be available uh, as a food source uh, because there is some type of crop loss uh, associated with it. Uh, and so the idea is we want to try to modify these organisms to make them more resistant to insect predation. And so one example of this is Bt, Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, is, is a bacterial toxin. Uh, back, I'm sorry, Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, whatever this word is, Bt, uh, is a, a bacteria uh, that produces a toxin um, that basically kills uh, certain types of insects. Uh, and so uh, the insects that kind of grow uh, and try to feed on the, the area that has Bt, uh, they're just going to kill them off and they're not going to eat it. Uh, the idea being that if we, you know, put Bt uh, onto the corn as it's growing, these insects aren't, aren't going to be doing it. Uh, there's also going to be uh, some uh, genetically modified organisms that are herbicide uh, tolerant. Uh, herbicides uh, like pesticides are, are basically going to be used to kind of kill weeds. Uh, and so uh, kind of kill the weeds. They're not, you know, strangling, kind of preventing the, the corn plants in this case from growing well, uh, we got to kind of get rid of the weeds. Uh, but if we use a high concentration of the herbicide, it could potentially kill uh, our, our grain crops as well, kill our corn plants uh, in the example here. Uh, so ideally what we want is going to be plants that are going to be resistant to insects and resistant to herbicides. And so we've got the technology uh, to be able to go in and genetically modify these organisms to change their DNA uh, to make it resistant and potentially to decrease the amount of crop loss uh, that we're seeing uh, in productivity. And this is important as the, the population of the world continues to grow, uh, it becomes harder and harder to provide enough food for everybody. Uh, so if we take a look at this, uh, looking at the United States, the use of genetically engineered crops, uh, from 1996 to uh, 2018, this is the percentage of planted aphids uh, that are uh, HT is uh, uh, herbicide tolerant soybeans, herbicide uh, tolerant cotton, uh, BT uh, is that Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, so producing that uh, toxin that keeps insects from uh, preying on it. Uh, and we've got cotton that's been treated with it, we've got corn treated with BT. Uh, and then we got uh, herbicide tolerant uh, corn down here as well. And you can see that this uh, started uh, commercial introduction uh, about 1996. Uh, and we can see that a very small percentage of the, the acres that were planted within the United States had these genetically modified uh, plants uh, to start out with. Uh, but now uh, in 2018, the most recent data that I can find, what we can see is that you know, between 80 and maybe 90% of the acres uh, planted with like soybeans or cotton, uh, when we take a look at them, they are going to be uh, these genetically modified organisms. And so uh, within a period of, of roughly 20 years, uh, we've gone from very few genetically modified plants uh, in productivity to a majority of plants in productivity uh, as being these genetically modified uh, food crops. Now, if we take a look at this, uh, we have a lot of concerns about it. People have a lot of concerns about eating genetically modified organisms, genetically modified food sources. And so if you go to the grocery store, you can find labels that say, you know, 
this is genetically modified organism free or GMO free uh, because they're coming from um, resources that aren't using these transgenic organisms. Uh, and that's a desire for some people. Uh, but if we take a look at the, the regulations associated with it, uh, it's looked at from both the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, uh, as well as the USDA, U.S. Department of Agriculture. Now, the Food and Drug Administration uh, has looked at these genetically modified food sources and, and said basically uh, that they're substantially equivalent to the existing foods. So similar to what they said about the generic drugs, and we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. You've got the brand drugs and the generics are uh, biologically equivalent uh, to the name brand drug. Uh, genetically modified food sources are substantially equivalent to the existing foods that were available. Uh, however, they have uh, expressed a concern for the potential uh, that these genetically modified foods could cause allergies or the buildup of toxins within people's systems. And so there are some concerns, but in general, uh, it's been approved for use. The U.S. Department of Agriculture, their main goal uh, is to make sure that nothing is going to kind of kill off the, the agricultural production within the United States. They've looked at it, uh, and from the perspective of risk to plant health, uh, they've been able to say that, you know, under these circumstances, it's approved to use these genetically modified plants. Globally, uh, if we take a look at this, biotech crops, these genetically modified uh, crops, uh, again, similar to what we saw in the United States, uh, have been uh, increasing uh, over the last a little over 20 years, 20, almost 25 years now at this point, uh, consecutively grown uh, more and more uh, of the, the the acreage, more and more of the, the farmers around the world uh, have been using these genetically modified organisms. It's gone from about 1.7 million hectares uh, in 1996 to about 190 million hectares uh, within uh, 2017. Uh, and so basically what we're looking at is a very, very dramatic um, kind of development in that most of these uh, both uh, developing and developed nations uh, are using more and more of these genetically modified uh, food sources. Now, again, there are concerns associated with it. Uh, European countries uh, have restricted uh, the use of genetically modified organisms. Uh, most European countries, uh, the countries within the European Union, ban the growth of GMOs, um, so they don't want them growing within their own environment. However, uh, and this is a little bit strange, uh, they're one of the world's largest consumers of genetically modified organisms. Uh, and so basically what we see is that they don't want these genetically modified organisms growing in their area, uh, but they want the benefits of the food source. They want the benefits of uh, these genetically modified foods being present. Now, if we take a look at individual countries, some countries have stricter regulations than other countries, uh, and we would expect to see that. Now, if we take a look at this, um, similar to what we we're saying previously, pest infestation causes significant loss of crop productivity. So we have to increase the use of pesticides. Uh, and so we put more and more of these chemicals on it. Now, the problem is that you put more and more of these chemicals on it, uh, two things are going to happen. The first thing that's going to happen is that the, the insects are going to become resistant to the chemicals that we use. So we need to either change the chemicals we use or use a higher concentration. Uh, and so what that means is we got to use more and more of these harmful chemicals, these pesticides, to try to decrease crop loss. Uh, but it's like a little arms war going on. Uh, as we use more and more pesticides, the insects become more and more resistant to it. Uh, so that as we've seen an increase in the pesticide use, we haven't seen a decrease in the crop losses. It's basically uh, kind of running parallel to one another. So no matter how much we increase the pesticide use, the, the insects are, are coming up with a way that they can you know, do additional crop damage. Uh, and so that's not a good system, especially when we've got you know, limited um, agricultural area available to us uh, and a growing population worldwide uh, that has to be fed. So if we take a look at this, uh, BT corn, as we talked about before, uh, Bacillus thuringius, uh, abbreviated as BT, that's the bacteria, but it's also described as the protein. Uh, so we've got a genetically modified um, corn uh, plant. Uh, in essence, all the seeds, all the plants within this strain uh, are going to express that soil bacteria protein. 
Uh, and so basically what happens is this protein then kills uh, the caterpillars, uh, but doesn't uh, harm other insects that would be potentially in the same region. Uh, so it kills the things that would be feeding upon it. Uh, and so if you take a look at this, we've got non-BT corn on the left, BT corn uh, on the right. Uh, and you can see over here, lots of insect damage uh, being present. And over here on the BT corn, uh, we've got less, uh, less insect uh, feeding uh, as well. Now, if we take a look at it, uh, BT uh, has been purified from these bacteria, uh, the protein uh, has been used as an insecticide. So they would spray it onto growing corn plants. Uh, since the 1960s. So it's not something that's new, uh, but what is new is that we've now got these corn plants themselves producing it, as opposed to us going through and spraying the BT uh, onto the fields of corn. Now the Food and Drug Administration uh, has taken a look at it and says that the, the, the concentration of BT in this corn uh, or the B concentration of BT that's sprayed on the corn uh, is relatively low. Uh, you'd have to eat, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of corn to have it kind of build up to the point where it would be a concern. Uh, and most people normally aren't going to do that. And so because of that, the, the amount of toxin that's going to be present here doesn't raise or rise to the level uh, that it's concerning uh, to the Food and Drug Administration. It's not a concern uh, for uh, human health. Now the problem is an early study uh, indicated that monarch butterfly caterpillars uh, were also harmed by BT corn pollen. Uh, so a 1999 study um, basically took uh, BT corn, um, fed um, that BT corn leaves uh, to butterfly uh, caterpillars uh, at a concentration was about six times higher uh, than what they're going to find out in nature. And if it was six times higher, uh, it was causing death uh, of the monarch butterfly uh, caterpillars. Uh, a follow-up study in 2000 was much larger using a, a more normal uh, concentration uh, of the BT uh, that was present, uh, found that there was no significant risk uh, to the corn. Um, and it actually indicated that uh, the risks were lower than exposure to normal pesticides that were being treated. And so uh, there's kind of conflicting data out there. Uh, a lot of people still look at the 1999 study and say that that's a reason why we shouldn't be using um, uh, BT corn or BT cotton or, or any of these other ones that we're looking at. Uh, and it's an area that is continually uh, being studied. Uh, the other thing that we talked about uh, were herbicides. Uh, farmers use herbicides to kill weeds within the crop field. Uh, so normally what you would have here, you know, you've got the, the crops, the agricultural plants that you want to grow, uh, but in between them, you're going to have weeds that are growing. Uh, and those weeds can overtake and sometimes grow faster than our crop. Uh, and in doing so, it can kind of kill off the crop and disrupt um, disrupt the production uh, within the agriculture with these farm fields. Uh, so the idea is that uh, as we're uh, treating uh, all of these plants uh, with herbicides, uh, the weeds like the insects uh, are becoming resistant. Uh, so we have to use more and more of these chemicals, chemicals like Roundup, which has had a, a lot of concerns associated with it. Uh, bromoxynil, uh, again, is something else, uh, again, a, a, dangerous chemical uh, used to kill off uh, weeds in the, in the product, I'm sorry, in the agricultural fields, uh, but they have the risk of potentially getting into uh, the food supply. You know, that's why you want to, you know, wash off your vegetables if they've been treated with chemicals. Uh, now the idea is that the herbicide uh, HT um, modified, genetically modified plants uh, are going to result in kind of the need for less of uh, these toxic chemicals being added onto uh, these fields. Uh, and so the idea is that we're, if you're using these genetically modified organisms, we're going to be able to use less of these harmful chemicals and make the food source uh, safer. But again, there are a lot of concerns about this and a lot of conflicting data out there. Uh, another example, soybeans are, are a major uh, crop used uh, primarily for food uh, for cattle, pigs, and, and chickens, uh, as well as some human foods and a lot of food additives. Uh, the idea is if we use these genetically modified soybeans, we can use less of those harmful pesticides. So even though it is kind of altered, uh, it is becoming kind of less harmful 
you know, in, in, in theory, uh, less harmful because we're adding less of the harmful chemicals, the harmful pesticides and insecticides uh, and herbicides uh, to order to be able to grow uh, the plants that we're interested in. Now, another way uh, that we can look at genetically modified organisms is this idea of using genes to change the nutritional quality uh, of the, the organism that we're looking at, of the plant that we're looking at. Uh, and so one example of that is that vitamin A deficiency is a wi widespread form of malnutrition. Uh, vitamin A, you know, we get you know, pretty good vitamin A uh, within our diet here within the United States. Uh, but in other regions of the country, you can see where they have uh, a lot of the vitamin A deficiency uh, in these green countries through here, primarily the kind of the equatorial regions uh, around the world. Uh, what we can see is that there's anywhere from a quarter to 500,000 new cases of blindness uh, associated with vitamin A deficiency. And about half the people uh, that get this are going to die within a year of losing their sight. Uh, and so that's a huge problem. You're talking about you know, anywhere from 250,000 people dying a year from vitamin A deficiency. Uh, so the idea is that you want to try to supplement their diets uh, with vitamin A. Uh, with this idea that ideally, if you could find a food source that's going to have that, uh, that makes that readily available, you know, you don't have to worry about trying to get vitamins over to them or supplements over to them. You can basically have them eating their normal food source that's been supplemented in some way so that they have a higher concentration of, of vitamin A uh, being present. Now, normally, uh, the regions that we're looking at uh, are often going to have a, a high, um, high uh, dependence on rice within their diet. Uh, but natural rice plants uh, produce beta carotene in the leaves, uh, but not in the rice themselves. And so uh, white flesh crops, you know, white rice here uh, is going to be vitamin A deficient. You know, it's produced by the plants, but not the portion of the plant uh, that people are going to be eating. And so what scientists did is they said, okay, you know, we've got vitamin A deficiency kind of around the world. And it's this huge problem that we need to deal with. Uh, so how about if we go through and we genetically modify the rice so that instead of being kind of white rice here, uh, which doesn't have vitamin A, we are going to develop a new strain of rice, this golden rice over here, uh, that has higher levels of beta carotene, beta carotene that was produced in the leaves of rice, but not the seeds. Uh, and we're gonna do it in such a way uh, that that beta carotene is going to be expressed in the, what we would eat in the rice uh, seeds or the rice, whatever you would call it, the rice grains itself. Uh, and so you end up with this genetically modified food source uh, that is able to produce large quantities of beta carotene, which gives it its golden appearance. Uh, and then once it's eaten uh, by a human being, uh, the human uh, in their body can convert the beta carotene uh, into vitamin A. And that would then potentially uh, allow us to treat vitamin A deficiency by replacing white rice with golden rice. Now, golden rice was developed in 1999. And so uh, roughly 20 years ago, uh, it was developed. Uh, it was kind of established and, and out there. Uh, it's been tested and retested and analyzed, uh, but it still hasn't been made available for human use. Uh, and the reason for that is that there is continual opposition to genetically modified crops. Uh, and so even though this in theory could save millions of lives um, over a course of several years, um, we're still at the point of trying to get uh, final regulatory approval uh, to be able to use this uh, as a food source. And so, you know, this isn't to say, you know, right or wrong, but it's something to say, this is something that we need to think about. This is something we need to resolve. Is this safe? Is this something that we should be doing? Are there alternatives to uh, how we can, you know, provide vitamin A to this very vulnerable population uh, in a way that's safe and effective and renewable? Now, if we take a look at it, publish reports uh, providing conflicting information on the safety of genetically modified foods. Uh, there are a lot of reports out there saying genetically modified foods are good, a lot of reports saying genetically modified foods are bad, um, but there's just a huge amount of information out there. Not all the studies have been scientific. A lot of them lack appropriate controls. Uh, some of them, like the toxicity levels, uh, are uh, 
they're, they're looking at concentrations that are so high uh, that of course it's gonna cause a problem. Anything at a high dosage, high enough dosage uh, is gonna to cause toxicity. Uh, the way I often describe it is you need water to survive every day. Um, but if you have too much water, you're gonna drown. Um, so if you take a look at these, and we saw that example with uh, the BT corn, that uh, if you provide uh, monarch butterfly larvae with overly high quali uh, quantities of uh, the toxin, the BT toxin, it's gonna kill them off. Uh, but potentially if it's a more natural level, uh, what they're normally gonna be exposed to within the environment, uh, it may not be uh, harmful. Uh, and then finally, uh, and we see this throughout science, especially uh, with genetically modified organisms, more recently uh, with the anti-vaxxer movement, as we're talking about more and more need uh, for vaccines, is that they're, they're using old studies that have been refuted or, science, or studies that were thought to be scientific but didn't have the appropriate controls, many of which have been withdrawn um, because there were problems with them uh, or refuted. Uh, but that information is still out there. And for the general population, they look at these old studies, they don't see the new studies. Uh, and so because of that, there are a lot of concerns associated with it. Uh, again, we don't know the right answers. We don't know the wrong answers. All we can do is continue to study these using science and provide that information to others to make a decision about whether or not these genetically modified food sources uh, are safe and, and can be used uh, um, as a food source in a variety of locations. Now, uh, the reading for this uh, is a National Geographic article uh, related to global warming uh, and how uh, foods uh, are altered over time. Uh, so I encourage you to take a look at that. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Thank you and have a great day.